Good afternoon from Miami. This is Dr. John Bennett, home of Neurosurgical TV. Today we have the pleasure of hosting uh, the Jordan Neurosurgery Grand Rounds from Oman uh, with Dr. Abraham Sabaya. And I'll turn it right over to, to Dr. Sabaya. Welcome, Dr. Sabaya. It's all yours. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, so here you are, good day, good night, good afternoon, good morning, whatever you are. I'm Abraham Sweh from Amman, Jordan, and we are transmitting live from Amman, from the Farah Medical Campus. Uh, today I'm gonna talk about clinoidal meningioma, that is the anterior clinoid meningiomas. Uh, some people call it sphenocavernous. And as usual, I will discuss this from the clinical, radiological, operative, pathological, and pathological correlation. No doubt that the anterior clinoid meningiomas in that area are formidable lesions and they are very challenging lesions. So let's talk about the anterior clinoid process. We don't only need to know the anatomy of the anterior clinoid process, but the, the variations of anatomy in that area. And that applies to anywhere you would operate upon. So the sphenoid bone, the body, the medial lateral pterygoid plates, the greater wing and the lizard wing. People think of the lizard wing as really a little thing. It is a large thing. And in that wing, lizard wing, there is the optic canal and there is the anterior clinoid process. So have uh, anterior clinoid here. All this is the lizard wing of sphenoid. So it's a rather big area, actually. Again here, the body of the sphenoid, which contains the cella and the sphenoid sinus, the greater wing of the sphenoid, foramen ovale and the spinosum here. And you can see that this structure is really big. The anterior clinoid is just the medial tip, the medial part of this uh, great uh, structure, which is the lizard wing of the sphenoid, which contains the optic canal. So here we are, the body of the sphenoid, the anterior clinoid, the optic canal, and sometimes you get this middle clinoid. Of course, this is the dorsum cilli and the posterior clinoid. This is what I mean lesser. So the body contains the cella on top of the body, the sphenoid sinus inside, this is the sphenoid sinus, and this is the anterior clinoid, and this is the optic strut separating the uh, uh, optic canal from the uh, superior orbital fissure. So anterior clinoid is really big and some people even classify it because it's big into a tip, a head, a body and a base. Look at that. This paper, a very beautiful paper by uh, Hennesimi uh, Juha from uh, Finland and they describe this, the tip, the head, the body and the base of the sphenoid. So we have to stop thinking of the lizard sphenoid wing as something less or lesser. It is really big. So here you can see the tip, again, the same classification, tip, the head, the body, and the base. Again here, sometimes you will see this uh, anatomy in, in, in good shape here. We have removed the anterior clinoid so that you can see the severe orbital fissure. And what separates the optic canal from the spill of the fissure is the optic strut. So this is oblique view to show you the optic canal and the optic strut separating the optic canal from the superior orbital fissure. Same thing here, the anterior clinoid, the optic canal, the optic strut. As I said, sometimes there is actually calcification here and it forms a ring and that's called another middle clinoid ligament or middle clinoid foramen as it were. So not only that we need to know the anatomy of uh, the, uh, the anterior clinoid, the normal anatomy, but we need to know the abnormal anatomy. And this is reported to be there about 10 to 15% of population. So here you are. 
cir circling the uh, carotid is this middle climate process as, as in here, again as in here too. So we need to know what are the structures that are related to the anterior clinoid. It's so important. It's related to so many important neurovascular structures, including oculomotor nerve, which uh, is uh, the, the clinoid is actually on the severe aspect. The carotid is the inferior aspect of the anterior clinoid. Optic nerve is in the superior medial aspect. Let's see that. So here we are. If we look at the anterior clinoid, the third nerve in its segments going into the superior orbital fissure passes underneath the anterior clinoid. So the anterior clinoid is superior to the third nerve. Again, here it's looking from behind the superior clinoid, the anterior clinoid, the third nerve its various segments, dividing here into two parts in the severe orbital fissure. But as it goes into the roof of the cavernous sinus, it is underneath the anterior clinoid process. Visual view of a cadaveric specimen of the optic nerve, nerve chiasm, and lamina terminalis is here, posterior clinoid is here, carotid coming out as the intra subarachnoid segment of the carotid artery dividing into its branches and so on. And this is the posterior communicating going to the junction between P1 and P2 of the posterior cerebral. Again, the third nerve related to the anterior clinoid. Carotid passing underneath it also. So this is the anterior clinoid and this is the carotid and this is the ophthalmic artery. Ophthalmic artery arises from the dorsal aspect, dorsal or dorsomedial aspect of the uh, carotid artery. We need to know all this information if we want to operate on an anterior clinoid in a joma here. This beautiful view from the book of Vinko uh, Dallens. Vinko uh, Dallens came to Jordan, he gave uh, many cadaveric uh, lessons and structures. Uh, you can see the various parts of the carotid and the relationship of the carotid to the anterior clinoid. Beautiful view here. This is the para uh, clival segment, this is the cavernous segment, and this is the uh, clinoid segment, which is not intradural and extradural, and then it comes out as the uh, intracranial subarachnoid segment. So anterior clinoid is so much related to the carotid artery, and you can see here the bone and the carotid artery related to it. Also, we need to know the dural uh, rings that are surrounding the carotid artery in relation to the ophthalmic artery. Ophthalmic artery arises from the carotid after a sort of um, uh, more uh, intracranial, more subarachnoid space uh, away from the uh, uh, dural rings, whether the upper ring or the lower ring. So here we are showing you the, uh, the rings as it were lower ring and upper ring, or proximal ring and distal ring, just the same here again, we have removed. It is a structure that is there. Some people wrote some papers that do they exist or not, they do, but sometimes not in a form of a ring that we know. Again here, olfactory tract, optic nerve, the falciform ligament here, which could be small, few millimeters, it could be one full centimeter. So uh, the younger neurosurgeon resident should be aware of this fact. Uh, here is the optic nerve, the carotid band, you can see the ophthalmic artery arises in the subarachnoid space. Uh, the, 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 the upper ring is here and it goes into the optic canal. Of course, it crosses inside and then goes above the optic nerve to go medially. Again, pituitary gland and this and the cell and this is the uh, carotid and this is the ophthalmic artery. Here is the, of course, is the uh, anterior clinoid. If you drill out the anterior clinoid, then you'll come into the roof of the sinus. You'll see the clinoidal part of the carotid. You will see both the distal ring and the proximal ring. And usually there is a venous uh, uh, tributaries there that can cause some bleeding when you are doing the drilling. Of course, you can see here, sorry, you can see here the optic strut, as I said, separating us from the superior orbital fissure. 
relationship of the ophthalmic artery. Usually it comes distal to the distal to the upper ring, sometimes through the uh, upper ring, sometimes actually it does not go at all into the optic canal, it goes into the severe orbital fissure. Again, knowledge of the anatomy, knowledge of the abnormal anatomy and the anatomical variations that are there. So here we are, the optic nerve, the carotid, the anterior clinal process covering both the third nerve and the uh, carotid arch. Again, reminder of the fancy form ligament, which could be one to two millimeter or one full centimeter, anterior Tiroclinoid intact, tiroclinoid removed. So the distal ring is here, the proximal ring is here. Relationship of the uh, anterior to optic nerve, to the carotid, to the third nerve. <clears throat> Here the anterior has been removed. So anterior really is a very important landmark in the skull and in the skull base. And if you're doing any surgery there, you must have a full knowledge of the normal anatomy and the abnormal anatomy. Again, you are there near the cavernous sinus. So you need to know all the triangles of the cavernous sinus uh, that started, as you know, by Parkinson triangle, and then we have full 12 triangles now. One thing you would face when you do the uh, uh, tibiclinoid meningioma is the sylvian fissure and the sylvian fissure veins. And here is a group of veins draining into the uh, saphenoparietal sinus. These you would face in any uh, anterior uh, clinoid and meningiomas. So you need to know the anatomy. You need to know how to preserve them. You need to know how to you open the sylvan fissure, uh, going from the for the frontal and not for the temporal and so on, and the zigzag of the temporal, uh, zigzag of these uh, sylvan fissures. A beautiful paper from Japan about this relationship of these veins uh, and the sylvian fissure, superficial, uh, superficial middle cerebral vein uh, going into the sphenoparietal sinus. Again, this beautiful paper also from Japan showing a very beautiful uh, um, venous uh, uh, relationship. So if I have a, a meningioma here and the superficial middle cerebral vein is coming here to go into the sphenoparietal sinus, this actually meningioma may close the sphenoparietal sinus. So the drainage will be up towards the superior sagittal sinus. Here, it did not, it, it was closed completely, but the drainage is down through the uh, base of the temporal uh, lobe. Here, you can see that it's going into the cavernous sinus. So various types that you need to study uh, on venogram before you embark on doing any surgery at the uh, anterior clinoid. Uh, let's see how it looks radiologically. This is uh, the usual picture of the uh, image of the anterior clinoid process. But sometimes it gets aerated and the aeration is through the optic strut. So the communication between the sphenoid sinus and the anterior clinoid comes through the optic strut. As such, optic strut and coming here from the sphenoid sinus, like this. This is called type one. Uh, this is a larger one, it's type two. And type three is really extensive. It could be unilateral, it could be bilateral. So these are the variations here. It's a unilateral aeration of the anterior clinoid because part of surgery for anterior clinoid meningioma is to drill the anterior clinoid. And if you are not aware that this aeration, and then you will end with CSF leak, meningitis, and others. You can see here the bilateral aeration. So the, is the essence of the optic strut through which the air comes from the sphenoid sinus into the anterior clinoid. Same thing here, it's bilateral. And you can see the effect on the uh, optic canal. So we described the anterior clinoid as anatomy. Let's see about the clinoidal meningiomas, which as I said, sometimes they are described as sphenocavernous cavernous uh, meningiomas. Basically by definition, anterior clinoid meningiomas arising from the vicinity of the anterior clinoid process. 
but they may extend medially, laterally, and superiorly to various parts. If we want to discuss the anterior clinoidal meningioma, we should exclude those meningiomas coming from other areas like planum sphenoidale or tuberculum cellae or others. But remember that if the clinoidal meningioma grows to a larger size, then the exact origin is difficult to determine. And you would speak about, is this a cavernous sinus meningioma or this is anterior clinoidal meningioma? People solve that solve that problem. They say if more than two, three, two thirds of the tumor is extra cavernous, most likely this is clinoidal. This is a beautiful paper by John Chu from New York 2004 describing this as clinoidal cavernous, while this has a sphenoidal cavernous, of course with uh, overlap. So you can see that it is sometimes difficult to I differentiate this from that. Is this a cavernous or is this is anterior clinoid? Nevertheless, you need to know the anatomy. You need to know how to operate upon these structures. Uh, Simon Mefti from Little Rock, and now he's in Harvard, described this paper back in 1990, describing that we have three types of clinoid meningioma depending on where exactly they are arising. Remember, we said anterior clinoid is a very large structure. It is not a small area. So this description and the classification is real. Type one, which is this one, and which is just overlying where the carotid artery is as it comes out, is the most difficult. Because there is definitely uh, infiltration. There is definitely a close uh, relationship between the artery and the meningioma. Type two is easier because you are not in touch with the, with the, with the, with the uh, carotid artery. Type three is also easier than this. Of course, they are not easy, but they are easier than this. So the most difficult one is this one related to the carotid. This is related to the lateral aspect of the clinoid. And this is exactly over the optic canal. So this is what uh, Hassan and Mufti described. Type one, this is the optic nerve. The anterior clinoid is here, but medial to the anterior clinoid, the tumor is in touch with the carotid artery. So it is surrounding it. You may not find a good plan of cleavage. And you sometimes have to accept defeat that you would leave a remnant there. Type two, you moved out, you moved to the lateral aspect of the uh, clinoid. So you may find a good plan of cleavage, as in here. Compare this with this. There is a plan of cleavage here, there is a clinoid. While in the uh, third type, which is overlying the optic canal, uh, it's rather easier than the others, but maybe it will press on the optic nerve. And this type usually does not attain large size because it will cause visual manifestations and people would go to uh, doctors for examination. Uh, this beautiful paper again uh, from China, anterior clinoidal meningioma, the relationship with the meninges, the various parts of the, uh, of the uh, clinoid. Remember, we are having or dealing with a large structure. It's called lizard wing, but it is large structure. So various parts, one, two, three, and four. Uh, type, type one of, of, of salmon nifty is arising from here. Type two is arising from here. And type three is arising from here, uh, and so on. So this is a close look to see that uh, the most difficult part, the most difficult uh, clinoidal meningioma is this one. Here they have classified it into four types, which is okay, it's the same thing. Type one, but type two, have they have classified it to type two A and two B, not much of a difference. Uh, basically the same like the salmon nifty. Uh, but again, the description is beautiful, type one. Type two A. 2B, as you can see here, this is the anterior clinoid and it's going into the cavernous sinus. Type 3, going medially. And type 4, going both medially and laterally, as such. The relationship of this anterior clinoid and meningioma is massive with much of the neurovascular structures, and that depends on the. Uh, 
uh, increase in size and which direction they would grow. So here, this is type three of Osama 50 sitting on top of the optic canal, infiltrating the canal, causing visual symptoms. So they don't attain large size like the other types. So type three does not attain large size usually. There is optic canal involvement with these cases. This is optic nerve and the optic, opti the um, anterior clinoid is here. You can see that it is growing into the optic canal. Uh, again, again, we are seeing uh, this paper uh, describing the high incidence of optic canal involvement as in here, growing into the optic canal. You can actually see the optic canal involvement on, on MRI. And this is a beautiful view, uh, T2, where you can see here the optic nerve. This is normal optic nerve with the subarachnoid space around it, CSF around it here. You don't see uh, all of the CSF, so the optic canal is involved. Where does the blood supply come from to the anterior clinoid and meningioma? Classically, people would teach you that it's coming from the meningeal orbital artery, the middle meningeal artery, posterior model in particular, which is a branch of the ophthalmic, as you know, or directly from the ophthalmic artery. But few people would describe these twigs from the bifurcation of the internal carotid artery. Like this, optic nerve, here is the chiasm. You can see the carotid artery dividing into A1 and M1. And this is a twig coming here from the bifurcation going to the dura of the anterior clinoid. So if you have an anterior clinoid and meningioma, this could be a very important blood supply, or as in this case, or coming from the carotid artery directly from the posterior communicating and so on. So they have really extensive blood supply. Uh, this paper from Michael McDermott, and you know Michael is an meningioma man. He described this paper in Journal of Neurosurgery 2016, uh, trying to show you the blood supply of these meningiomas, anterior clinoidal meningiomas, or tuberculum cell meningioma, and uh, using the uh, technique that he used in the aneurysm uh, to see the blood supply coming to these meningiomas. CT angio would be useful and helpful to see the ramification of the carotid artery and the blood supply and so on. So CT angio is very helpful. Anterior clinoidal meningioma with, with this CT angio and conventional angio. You can see the blush and you can see where the blush coming from so that you would know which is the main uh, feeders and sometimes you may you need to do embolization. I really do that, but sometimes I need it to. As I said, this is the paper which I described before the regarding the venous drainage of the Selvin veins and these anterior clinoidal meningiomas. Can they be associated with others? Yes, here in this particular paper uh, from Pakistan, uh, the yeah, association of the anterior clinoid with an aneurysm. بحكي اليوم الانترنت زفت على بعض المحاضرة. Also bilateral intracranial aneurysms here in relation to the anterior clinoidal meningioma. So meningiomas aneurysms could be associated, cortical meningiomas associated with basal meningiomas and so on. Once you see a, a, a clinoidal meningioma being small or large, you have a good differential diagnosis to make. This could be hemangioparasitoma, which is very much related to the meningioma, but it's a different entity now. Chondrosarcoma, look at this, it looks very much like a meningioma, so don't be misled. Osteosarcoma, metastasis, coming exactly where the sphenoid wing meningiomas are. Giant cell tumor, angiofibroma. Lymphoma. Lymphoma is a forgotten disease. We have to remember it all the time. Multiple myeloma. Paraganglioma. Fibrous dysplasia. Anaplastic fibrosarcoma. Granuloma. 
Wagner. So differential diagnosis is why then you have to keep your eyes open. How do they present? As I said, most of the time they present with headaches and visual. These are the main manifestations. Visual is more in type three, uh, which is sitting on, on top of the optic canal, uh, headaches in, in three times. Again, the presentation depends on the extension. You may get proptosis, you may get cranial nerves, if the cavernous sinus is involved, you may get epilepsy if the temporal lobe is involved. You may get also with the brain pushing on the crust, getting hemiparesis. What is the main treatment? Microsurgery is the main upfront treatment of these meningiomas. Because of the tumor biology, benign or malignant, and the inherent cytotoxic limitations of radiant chemotherapy, surgery is superior and better for all tumors from scar tissue. And who said that? My friend Atul Gul. It's a very clear statement that surgery comes first. And I add that meningioma surgery in this particular region is challenging. It is a highly technical job. So what approach do you do? Frontoorbital, frontoorbitozygomatic, standard terional, extended terional, and geotemporal, what pretemporal and so on. Depends on the size and extension of the tumor. By the way, anterior clinoidectomy has been described first time back in 1968 by late Professor Charles Drake from Canada, and he used this for ophthalmic aneurysm. And then came Professor Yazafil back in 1977, where he added the intradural drilling of the uh, anterior clinoid, and the uh, 1985 Vinko uh, describe the extradural drilling of the anterior clinoidectomy. So this is something that is well established in the neurosurgical practice. This paper, again here by Michael Sigru and Michael McDermott, both are um, in the German. And I think Michael Sigru moved now from New York, from San Francisco back to, to uh, join uh, um, two in, in, in Canada and in, uh, in Australia. And they described both this paper, meningiomas of anterior clinoid process. Is it twice the drill on the optic canal? The answer is yes. And they showed this beautiful picture where they are drilling here, the uh, anterior clinoid and opening the optic canal, taking this one from the roof of the optic canal, the borders of the, this is the, this is the nerve in the canal, and these are the borders here. The same thing here at the optic nerve in the subarachnoid space going into the canal. So you may do minimal clinodectomy, you may do partial uh, clinodectomy, you may do total clinodectomy depending on your case. And you may use the son of it, you may use a drill, electrical drill, or use the micro -ringer. And this is a picture to show you the removal of the anterior clinoid, anterior clinoidectomy here in this case. Here is it intact and here it has been removed. So this is total uh, anterior clinoidectomy. Here you have also when you do that, you have to remember the, as I said, the vascular relationship and the encasement. Usually this is called the Bermuda Triangle. Uh, this is rightly so described, rightly so by Daniel Barrow and his, his group and Sam, uh, in Pittsburgh. And you can see that this is really important uh, to know the grades of the involvement and encasement of these vessels. If you face a case like this where it is totally encased and there is narrowing of the vessels, then you have to accept defeat that you cannot remove all the tumor. If you look at the uh, literature and see what is the extent of cross total resection in the papers published, it ranges between 43 to 91. It can never be 100%. You can never speak about uh, Simpson grade one accession in this, in, this, in this area. The same thing like you don't speak about Simpson grade one in petroclypal meningiomas, for example. And the recurrence, therefore, is rather high 4 to 26%. I mean, this is the across the board of the papers published. I choose to make this table, I did it myself, uh, looked at the paper published and Mifti back in 92, he reported 24 patients, he had two mortality, 
And this is a gross total intersection, which is grade one to two. Uh, Gowen uh, reported 60 cases back in 2000, and he had three uh, mortalities and he uh, achieved gross total resection in 42. But I wanted to say that this is a major challenging surgery and you may find that you have a mortality and you will accept that you cannot do a gross to total resection in all cases. A very a nice paper, uh, it was very with, with, uh, the enjoyment, a surgical tips for describing the enjoyment, which as I said is just like the uh, clinoidal meningioma. And also this paper from Russia. And uh, reading actually the, 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 uh, the free uh, sort of comments on this paper is very, very refreshing that uh, not only this is uh, done in Bardenko Institute, some across Russia where a very high standard of neurosurgical practice is done. And I look with admiration and, and uh, respect to Professor, Professor Konovalo at the uh, Bordenko Institute. Uh, they mentioned the uh, Kaplan Meyer for the, uh, as you know, for the, uh, uh, which is better in, the, in terms of uh, the progression free survival. And they conclude that there was no significant difference between total removal, subtotal removal, or with adjuvant treatment. So sometimes you have to stop. If you can remove, go ahead. If you can't, you stop. And here, this paper also uh, from Japan about early nerve decompression. When you are doing uh, this, which is a very important part of surgery, the drilling of the anterior clinoid, the opening of the optic canal is an inherent part of this surgery. And this again paper by uh, Yuha Hanishimi from Finland, as I said, he is now uh, situated in the place in um, practicing in China. Uh, showing that he can do this and see the meningioma by a lateral supraorbital approach. And this is very, again, very beautiful uh, paper by my great friend, uh, Felix Kamansky uh, from Hadassah, uh, describing his experience in these large clinoidal meningiomas. Again, this is a man to respect. He wrote so many papers on the cavernous sinus, medial wall, lateral wall, roof, and uh, he is uh, an authority in that area. So he's describing his uh, um, series of large clinoidal meningiomas. So they can be very large. And when you see such something like this, you cannot swear whether it started at the anterior clinoid and went to the cavernous sinus or the other way around. Is there a place for endoscopy? Endoscopy, as I said, I keep saying in the hands of endoscopists lies the future of a neurosurgery. Endoscopists have been doing a great job for these uh, tuberculum cell meningiomas. But as far as anterior clinoidal meningioma, very few papers have been published. This is one of them uh, published recently from Boston, USA, about the use of the uh, endoscope for removal of anterior clinoidal meningioma. There are so many uh, things to discuss in, the, in this part difficulty of drilling the optic canal uh, 360 degrees. As I said, this is well established uh, in the nasal transnasal approach for clinical meningioma and so on. Radio surgery, is there a place? Not upfront, but for those res uh, residual cases or recurrent cases. And this is a paper from Istanbul uh, about gamma knife for these uh, clinical meningioma on 61 consecutive cases, a big series really, uh, treating these uh, primarily and secondary. Uh, I would not go personally for gamma knife uh, for, uh, for uh, anterior clinoidal meningiomas. I would refer my patient if there is a recurrence or a residual that has grown in spite of the period of observation. Let's, let me now speak about my series. I was lucky, I got about 60 cases. I've lost uh, follow-up on 18 of them. So I'm reporting the ones that I really have a good follow-up on them, which is minimum of two years between the year 90 to 2018. I leave always two years because I would not include the case that I have done middle of 2018 now. I need to have at least two years to report it. 
this is a very peculiar case. This is a lady who comes to me from United Arab Emirates. Uh, she came with a headache, no visual symptoms. And look at this, soft part, solid part involved in the uh, anterior clinoid, carotid is in the middle of everything. Look at this. And examining her, she had no neurological deficits. I said, well, maybe we have to go for surgery to prevent uh, the ophthalmological uh, uh, problems. Uh, she refused and she said, even if I get blind, I accept it. Believe you me, I've been following this lady for the last 10 years and there has been no change in the size or configuration of this journal. So 42 cases, of course, females more than males, uh, peak age 40 to 50, mean age 45, and uh, symptoms of manifestations of the, of, uh, they presented with the visual uh, dysfunction, papillary edema, headaches, cognitive problems, seizures, hemiparesis. Uh, for all patients, we do full ophthalmological assessment, including visual acuity, fields, uh, color vision, fundoscopy, optic nerve OCT, and we look for exophthalmos. So visual fields, and we use the German score for the visual uh, fields, the visual acuity and the visual field. We combine them together to give us a score and we do this before surgery and after surgery. Optic OCT to see whether there is any atrophy of the optic nerve. Of course, this is from the And sometimes we resort to doing visual evoked responses like this patient of mine. We uh, do psychological testing. I do psychological assessment, and, and that is in particular Karnofsky performance scale for all my patients going through uh, cranial surgery. For me, this is a, a very important uh, topic. Uh, let me show you the images of my cases. So I'm not gonna show you any image which is outside my, my field. If anything comes up, I will point it out to you. CT, look how, how important it is to show you the enlargement of the anterior clinoid. And look at here, the optic nerve is being compressed completely. Here, radiation of the anterior clinoid. You can see here various anterior clinoid processes in various cases of mine. So CT is very important. I always insist on having CT. Uh, you can see the general information and the specific information about the anterior clinoid process. Uh, angiogram, whether it is MRA, MRV, or whether it is CT angio or conventional angiogram is important. So we insist on doing MRA, MRV for all patients is part and parcel of the MRI. So when I speak MRI, I mean MRI, MRA, MRV. We do angiography of various uh, parts and we are interested in seeing the ophthalmic artery, which is usually the main feeder for these anterior clinoid meningiomas from posterior clinoid directly from the ophthalmic artery, from the severe hypovisual artery and so on. Venogram is important here, we see the uh, tumor sort of uh, going venous return into the cavernous sinus. Here is the severe metrosal sinus. MRI, and I will show you the MRI of my cases. Uh, this is the collection I have. As I said, I have 60 cases. The ones I operated and followed up is 42 cases. <clears throat> so this is some of these cases. Some of them small, some of them large. I just go through them for your interest. Various shapes, various locations, sometimes associated with severe edema. You can see from our eye, you can see the vascular relationship. So what approaches did I use in these uh, cases, 42 cases? Terrional mainly with its modification, 27 cases, frontoorbital and 15 cases. This is one of, uh, this is the approach of uh, terrional. This is how you approach it and how you see the structures. And here in this particular case, it was engulfing the carotid artery, the anterior cerebral middle cerebral artery, but you could find a good plane of cleavage 
and dissect it completely. Optic nerve, carotid artery, anterior cerebral, middle cerebral. How much did we achieve? Simpson 1 to 2, 22 out of 42. Simpson grade 3 and 4 together are 20. We followed them for a long period of time, 24 months, which is minimum, up to 127, average of 64. And we found that there was residual on the MRI, which we do the very next morning of the surgery, the very next morning, we don't delay it. We could see a residual in 20 patients. As I said, you have to accept defeat in these cases. What would you do? What did we do when we had this residual? We observe. If they grow, we may go for surgery again or gamma knife. So as people think of me as an anti-gamma knife, I'm not. I am anti-abuse of gamma knife. I believe in gamma knife is a good tool, but it has to be used properly and should be not left in the hands of mediocre surgeons. In 22 cases, we had no residual, it was free. And we have done radical excision in, in Simpson grade one to two. Again, we followed them up and we found progression, we found uh, recurrence, sorry, in two. And again, when we found this uh, progression uh, or recurrence, again, you can resort to surgery or gamma knife. I will allude to this later on. I show you some cases. What about visual outcome? improved in 26 cases, static, did not change in 14, and that's because there is long pressure, long period of time where the pressure was on the optic nerve, and it got worse in two cases. Did I have any mortality? Luckily, fortunately, I didn't. Morbidity, like the others, CSF leak in four, uh, wound infection, epilepsy, pyramidal uh, signs, dysphasia, ptosis, and cognitive functions. One of the complications was CSF leak and meningitis occurred because we did not pay attention. We did not recognize that we have entered stereothmoidal air cells as we were drilling the anterior clinoid. However, this was corrected. We did put a, a drain, it did not improve. So I went in and repaired it and the patient is doing well. We published our work about the predictive markers for meningioma grading, myself and my colleague, Hassan Abu Farsakh from the first medical lab here in Jordan. Uh, and we published this in the American Pathology Academy. We looked at uh, last consecutive 244 meningiomas and looked at them uh, from various uh, points. Regarding age, we found that the high grade comes in the younger age, which is bad. This has not been reported before. If we look at the gender, we know females are more than males. Again, in grade three, it was more in males than females, six to five. Atibia was more, of course, in the grade three. Brain invasion was more in grade three. Bone invasion was more in grade three. And the necrosis and the percentage of necrosis was more, of course, in the grade three. This goes with the general literature, stream of literature, but the two points that I mentioned that the younger age are going with the high grade and the males are of the high grade. These are two that been reported before. Mitotic count, of course, is large in the grade three. P53, as you can see here, P53, in this range is in grade one and two, it is uh, less in grade three. So the higher the P53, the better. And the higher the P63 is better. When it's low, it, you see it in the high grades. Progesterone, again, when it is high, it's good. When it is low, it is bad. Ki67, as you know, is more in the third time. So this paper has been published in the American uh, Journal of Pathology. Let me show you some of the illustrative cases of mine, and then we go for the uh, some of the videos. Uh, this 56-year-old female patient with this clinoidal meningioma before and after surgery. This 70-year-old female patient 
uh, there's no place here for gamma knife. This is this has to be drilled really. Uh, and one of the um, things that one can do is this uh, uh, fiesta uh, sequence where you can see the optic nerve and its length and where the meningioma is. So we did the surgery. This is before and this is after. Uh, this lady from Iraq, 55 year old female lady with this. This was associated with the most extensive edema I have seen. I was worried that this may tend to be malignant. It was a grade one actually. But it was associated with extensive edema. Again, we followed her for many years and she's doing well. <clears throat> this 52 year old lady, uh, uh, again from uh, Libya, with this tumor, anterior clinoid, and the long follow up and the lady herself. Uh, again, this patient from Jordan with this tumor here and post up. This very giant tumor, which when I saw my heart sunk actually, I did not want to, I wanted her to go somewhere else, but she insisted and I had to go and it was really frightening to see this picture. We went in, and this is immediate post-operative. This is really one about a week later, and this is a long follow-up. Now you may argue there is a remnant there, but we are following that up, and nothing is happening. Okay. Again, this lady with this uh, <coughs> meningioma before and after surgery. This 63-year-old lady with this giant uh, in German. And this lady from Jordan with this uh, huge uh, giant anterior in German. And this where you will face the veins. So I will show you the video. Uh, to face the vein in front of you before you get into the tumor is something frightening. Again, this anterior in German before and after surgery. And this 55 year old male patient. 70 year old female patient with this extensive tumor before surgery and after. And again, this here, again, you see the vessels in casement. You may say, oh, this is inoperable. Don't say that because once you go in, you will discover whether it is operable or inoperable, whether you can dissect it of the uh, vessels or not. We left remnant and we've been following that for so many years without any change. Let me now share with you the recurrent, the recurrent cases. Uh, this Jordanian lady, 45 year old female patient with this uh, meningioma, which I operated and we left just a remnant there. And it's repaired, of course. Uh, she refused any further treatment. Uh, this is a Jordanian patient uh, of mine, 38 year old male patient with this extensive uh, meningioma. Again, I uh, had to leave this residual on the lateral surface of the cavernous sinus. He's the one who developed ptosis, but that was transient. It disappeared in two months' time. Uh, so it recurred, and we have to give gamma life. So again, I'm not an anti-gamma person. I am against the abuse of the gamma life. I am with the use, the good use of gamma life, against the abuse of gamma life. Uh, this very... Um, a um, uh, very nice lady. She's a professor of English language. Uh, at that time, she was 47, coming with this. Again, look at the bifurcation here. Look at the vessels going everywhere. And I really wanted to do embolization, which really helped me uh, a lot. Uh, this is the post-operative. You may argue that we left a piece there, but she did well, and then she developed recurrence. We gave gamma knife. It did not respond to grew again, and the patient refused any further treatment. So let me show you now some of the videos, and I would uh, go through them very quickly. With each video, which will last maybe less than a minute, uh, we just show a certain point so that we will uh, uh, learn from uh, the video as much as we can. <coughs> Uh, this is the lady which I showed you the uh, sitting in front of you with the vessel with the veins of the sylvian veins uh, going into the sphenoparietal sinus here. 
again, being patient, going between the blood vessels, the arteries, the branches of the middle cerebral, and the veins, branches of the superficial middle cerebral, going into sphenopolitan sinus. Uh, just being patient, uh, you will, it will pay you. It's, it is a good dividend. So here we are separating the vessels from the surface of the uh, tumor. And here, this is the uh, middle cerebral artery going here into the carotid. Again here, finding a good plane of cleavage. So don't be disheartened when you see they are attached. You have to differentiate between blood vessels going to the tumor and those who are not going to the tumor. Here I'm seeing the carotid. Still the tumor is attached to it. I'm opening the carotid cistern. As you can see that we are working between the veins and the arteries. And then just being patient and uh, devascularizing the tumor, you can get rid of it completely. So here we are taking this in between these branches of middle cerebral artery and of the middle cerebral superficial veins. Here we are taking it from the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. So the, the more you try, the better when you remove as much as you can, that will be fine. And this is the beautiful picture of the optic nerve and the uh, structures. Okay. Uh, this is uh, just from the beginning. You have to drill the uh, greater wing of sphenoid until you reach to the anterior clinoid. And you can see the periorbiter here. So the ring of the internal uh, clinoid extradurally, like uh, described by Vinko Dolenz. This is temporal, this is a frontal. Here, you have done the drilling here, and you have opened the optic canal removing the edge, the lateral edge of the optic canal, freeing the optic canal completely, opening the falciform ligament, and also the dura, which is within the uh, optic canal. Again, drilling of the uh, bone involved, and uh, here I just want to show you that we're drilling on the right side. And once you drill here, having drilled the anterior clinoid and you open the optic canal, look at the distance here, you can see a good distance. And you can see here immediately the ophthalmic artery. If you're not careful, and you may damage that, but you need to remove the tumor from inside. Now going to the other side here, I will show you that there is a big chunk of the tumor inside the Optic canal. We have done the anterior climatectomy. We have opened the optic canal, opened the falciform ligament, drilled the bone here, and this allowed us to remove this chunk of the tumor going inside the optic canal. This surgery is highly demanding. It needs good knowledge and good uh, knowledge of the abnormal anatomy instead, in addition to the normal anatomy. Okay. Here, another case where the tumor is attached uh, to the uh, stoke. And here it is attached to everything surrounding the optic nerve and the carotid artery. Because you don't know where it's going to grow. These clinoidal meningiomas, they can grow anywhere they like. So the aim is to remove as much as you can. Again, here we free the stroke and you can see the posterior climate. Okay. Tumor is separated from the optic nerve and chiasm.
and opening of the dura. Uh, here is the optic nerve. You want to open the dura so that you can drill the anterior clinoid and remove any involved dura. Okay. Here is the, the drilling of the clinoid intradurally. Uh, and the last piece is the most difficult one. And it is the one that you have to be careful because it is sitting here on top of the carotid artery in the roof of the cavernous sinus. And you can see the blue color here of the venous plexus that's surrounding the clinoidal segment of the carotid. Here we remove the involved dura, we open the falciform ligament and the dura in the optic canal. Here you can see the third nerve at the edge of the genitorial edge here. You can dissect the arachnoid and gain further entry. Again here, we have done the drilling of the uh, anterior clinoid intradurally. Uh, we continue to do the do so until we open the optic canal and open the severe orbital fissure. If the case wasn't associated, here is the uh, neural fold between frontal and temporal. And here is the drilling to open the severe orbital fissure completely. This case was one of the difficult cases, one of the cases that was really difficult, uh, extensive anterior clinoidal meningioma extending into through the tentorial notch into the posterior fossa here. Uh, you can see here I'm separating the tumor from the middle cerebral artery, going into the carotid here. Again, you have to differentiate between the bleed, the, the feeders of the tumor or the impass artery, carotid, middle cerebral, anterior cerebral. Here's the third nerve. So it was extending everywhere. Right here from the anterior clinoid went medially, went posteriorly, went into the capillary sinus through the anterior notch into the posterior fossa. This is the optic nerve here on the left side working between the carotid and the optic nerve. Again, it looks formidable. You cannot remove it. Being patient, trying to find a good plane of cleavage using the ultrasonic aspirator, carefully, of course. Here we're removing it from the anterior clinoid, here are the anterior clinoid, which is the main feeder here. That's why you see a lot of bleeding. Again, carotid, anterior cerebral, middle cerebral, encasing, complete encasement. Can we do that? Yes, we can. Here is the posterior communicating. Let's try and strip it off the tumor. Let's see whether we can. Actually, we did at the end of the day, remove it from there. Again, here working in various compartments. Whenever you feel disheartened in one compartment, you try your luck in another compartment, carotid to full extent. And you can see here the optic nerve, and you can see here the stoke, the tutory stoke. So nerve, stoke, carotid artery. And what is there? Here is the It looked formidable and not excisable at the beginning. But as I said, don't judge that before you go in. Uh, have a good information, have a good vision of what you are going to find, and then give the patient his best chance. The first chance is the best chance. So again, the carotid was still communicating, we went into the visceral fossa following the tumor and removed it from there. This is the basal artery here, its branches. The severe
in the posterior cerebral. And you can see this is the posterior communicating going to the posterior cerebral artery. All right. Now, this is the last video, and I think I have finished in good time. We did not increase anything on over the one hour that we promised that we would finish. Again, here, frontal, temporal, straightening the dura of the uh, strain, greater wing of sphenoid, drilling it until you reach to the anterior clinoid here. And uh, you drill that extradurally, then you go in, drill it intradurally, and so on. Copious uh, saline to uh, avoid the heat damage for any structure, and then going in. This is an anterior clinoid meningioma. I started with the temporal extension. This is here, the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. Remember, this is temporal, this is frontal, and we started here with the, uh, I usually do so, start at the mm, uh, temporal part. Again, here you face the branches of the middle cerebral artery. Some of them go into the tumor, some of them they are in pass. You have to differentiate here, this is the a branch that's going into, again here, middle cerebral with its branches. What is the branch going into the tumor? What is the branch which is in pass? Careful, patient dissection. No matter what the time, whether it takes 10 hours or 16 hours or 22 hours, uh, there's a jump that you need to do and you need to do it patiently. Here, the moving part of the arachnoid, which is attached to the optic nerve here, we know the carotid is here. This is still cuff of the tumor around middle cerebral going into the carotid. Easy and slowly, you can actually strip it. Optic nerve. The carotid is here, anterior cerebral, middle cerebral. So obviously now we should come across the third nerve, which we'll see in a minute. So this is the third nerve. We are after every piece of the tumor, if we can. If we can't, we can't, but if we can, that's good. So carotid, and this is the middle cerebral, anterior cerebral is there, and still a cuff of the tumor here at the tintural edge surrounding the posterior communicating artery. So you end with something like this, carotid, posterior communicating, middle cerebral, anterior cerebral, and so on. Okay, with this I finish and I'm happy to take your comments and questions. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, your presentation was nice and sweet. So it's, uh, we are always grateful to have you as a mentor and you. you are our inspiration and the role model. Thank you. So yeah, I will ask uh, people to ask questions. Those who are not able to talk, they can post their questions uh, uh, on the chat. So, Prof, I have one question. Uh, sure. Two small questions for you uh, before we go to others. Uh, sure. The first one was, have you ever encountered a bilateral anterior clinoidal uh, meningioma? And the second one, uh, when do you do, when do you repeat MRI scan uh, in post-operative period? When do you do it? Right. Uh, as far as the post-operative MRI, it is the following morning, whether I finished at 2 o'clock in the afternoon or 10 p.m. or early hours of the morning at 2 a.m., the MRI is at 7 a.m. the following morning. There is no reason to delay it, and there is nothing that can convince me that CT is the best for these cases. MRI has the upper hand even in terms of the detecting the bleed. So this... Uh, excuse of doing CT post-operatively, I do not uh, believe in it. I think anybody who does CT post-operatively does not want any, anybody to see the result of his work. So I insist on doing MRI and I insist doing it the following morning. 
uh, bilateral and cheetah the main job, in this case, it has to be arising from the tuberculum cell going both sides. So you better speak about it as tuberculum cell meningioma rather than bilateral clinoidal meningioma. Thank you so much, Professor. We have a question on the chat from Rania. Uh, he says, what about the retraction technique you used? Retraction? Retraction technique. Well, simple, I don't keep continuous retraction. Sometimes you don't need retraction. The sucker will, will do the job for you. Uh, but sometimes you need a retraction, but always with the retraction, you have to be aware of the damage that you may cause to the brain tissue and don't keep that constant every every now and then you just release the uh, retraction. You give a good blood supply to the brain. Thank you, Professor. Uh, another question again from Rania. Uh, is the super, okay, from Adnan. Say, what is the most frequent blood supply of anterior clinoidal meningiomas? And uh, is there any need for pre-op embolization? Uh, right. Uh, the blood supply can come from any of the arteries around it, but the one that everybody accepts as the main blood supply coming from the autonomic artery uh, directly or through the posterior clinoid. But as I showed, it can come from the middle meningeal, from the carotid directly, from the severe heart vesicle, from the posterior communicating. So it is rich in blood supply. How often did I need to do embolization? Just one case of the anterior clinoidal meningiomas. And I showed that case to you already. Uh, it was very vascular, it was huge. But generally, I do not like to do embolization unless I have to. Embolization is extra a procedure, extra money, extra risk on the patient. So unless you really need it, do not do it. Okay, Professor, one more question from the chat before we ask the participant to ask questions. Uh, again, from Rania, uh, is the superficial middle cerebral vein is the same called superficial Sivion vein? In yes. Roton, yeah. you just called it superficial vein. Yes, they are the same, absolutely. We differentiate between the deep system and the superficial system. And the superficial middle cerebral vein is part of the superficial venous drainage, away from the deep venous drainage. And it goes either back to the cerebral sinus or goes to the sphenoparietal sinus or go to the cavernous sinus. Thank you, Professor. Now we are taking questions from participant. If you have a question, please raise your hand and feel free to ask questions. Okay, in the meantime, from the chat again, uh, how to repay pneumatized clinoidal process? from uh, Satya Narayana. Yeah, better not to open uh, pneumatized uh, uh, anterior clinoidal process, but people have uh, done this and they got safely. They could recognize there and then that there is a hole in this anterior clinoid leading to the sphenoid sinus. And I cannot remember who is the author who described this uh, pendulum uh, technique where he catches small piece of muscle and then he pulls it through into the defect in the anterior clinoid. But we know with the just a piece of muscle, piece of fat, and uh, the uh, glue, then you can actually uh, close it. If you discover this later on, then you can use lumbar drain. If it works well, if it doesn't, then you have to repair it either by a, a endoscopy, transnasal, which is usually difficult, or reopening again. Thank you. Any questions or comments from? Uh, yes, uh, from yes, Doctor Gabula. I be, believe Faraz Abdullah has a question. Go ahead, Faraz. Okay. Thank you. I'm Doctor Faraz, a neurosurgeon from Erbil, Iraq. Uh, thank you very much, Doctor Ibrahim, for this nice presentation. Your work is actually very impressive. My question is uh, how to deal with bleeding from uh, the major vessels during dissection of the tumor from the carotid or from the middle cerebral artery. All right, uh, I was fortunate I had only one case where there was bleeding from the uh, carotid artery and I just repaired it immediately uh, there and then. Uh, so I was lucky really, but you have to close it. You just cannot put surgery cell and things on top of it. It will cause pseudo aneurysm and it will rupture again. So the best thing is to repair it immediately and this happened to me once. And uh, you repair it with suture uh, material Yes. Which type and which? Oh. oh, okay. Thank you very much. Pleasure. 
Okay, Rapesh, Rapesh has a question. Go ahead, Rapesh. Yes, hi. Uh, hello, Professor. Thank you so much for this presentation again. Uh, I had a good time listening to you, as okay. always. So my qu question is, uh, for doing anterior clinodectomy, uh, how would you do it? Would you choose to do it intradurally or extradurally? Like, which one is better with less complications and more practical? Uh, actually, with all the cases of anterior clinodectomy in many journals, I'm speaking about the, 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 not the early part of my experience, but once I got experience with these, I used the extradural and the intradural. I found that you can not completely remove the clinoidal uh, process extradurally, so I do the best extradurally and then leave the last part for intradural. Thank you. Okay, Prof, I have uh, one more question. Sure. Yeah. Uh, in case you get CSF leak, do you also perform a lumbar drainage? If yes, what about if it persists? The patient is on lumbar drainage and persists, what do you do? As I said, uh, whether you discover that you have done uh, uh, opening into the steroid sinus or the tumoidal sinus, and then you do whatever you want to do there and then, plug it with muscle, with, with fat, with cell to cell, and with glue, you don't discover it and you find the next day the following day there is CSF leak, then the best thing the plan of action is to put the lumbar drain for four or five days. If that doesn't work, then you have to go and repair it endoscopically or reopening of your community. Thank you, Professor. Any other questions or comment from the panel? Uh, Dr. Ibrahim. Uh, uh, beautiful lecture. I'm Arturo Ayala from Mexico City. I saw your beautiful presentation. And um, what is your advice about the how length you need to remove the optic canal? We know the depends of the station of the tumor, but sometimes we we can make a, a huge uh, unroughing the compressions, like uh, a prevent the the the, the ischemic uh, lesion in, in the optic. What is your advice about this? Uh, whenever we're dealing with the optic canal, we have to deal with the optic canal as males as you treat a female. You have to be done with delicacy, with patience. You have to know exactly what you are doing. Don't put pressure by whatever drill or uh, son of it or the ranger when you are using it. You have to know the anatomy well. And if you do that, then the chances of doing this chemical kind of change to the optic is very, very little. Uh, you have to open the fanciform ligaments, you have to open the bony canal, you have to open the dural sheath around the optic canal. And as I said, being patient and delicate, then there should be no ischemic problems. Thanks so much, Sherry, and congratulations again for your presentation. You've had a lot of experience in about many Germans, and this is uh, outstanding uh, outcomes. And Thank thanks so much for this lecture. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Any other questions from the panel? Um, okay, Dr. Okay, Kubola. Professor, like to... Professor Ibrahim is uh, one of the giants of neurosurgery in the world. So we are so glad to have you as a, as a teacher. You are making us better and more thoughtful persons. So you deserve a big thank to for uh, all the sleepless night that you spent to prepare these presentations. Thank you so much, Professor. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks everyone for coming. And what's the topic next week, uh, Dr. Savez? Do you have uh, a topic yet? Because uh, next Wednesday I have uh, to uh, participate in the World Federation of Neurosurgical Society. Oh, okay. So the following week. So I'm part of the group that is presenting. I'm going to present about the uh, microsurgery for colloid cysts. So I thought that, you know, it will just interfere of having two lectures on the same day. So I'm not having my usual lecture. Next Wednesday, I'm having the meeting at uh, 12 p.m. 12 p. Uh, OK, we can televise that? Yeah. Well, oh, I great. So. I'm not responsible for it. Uh, Imad Kanaan is responsible. I can ask him. Oh, okay. We'll talk about it later. Sure. sure. Okay. Okay. The thank you. The other thing that, uh, as you know, are coming towards the Eid al-Adha, uh, 
which is the um, major event in the Islamic world, in the Arab world. It's a holiday. Uh, so during that Eid, we will not be uh, having any functions. I was thinking and I talked to uh, my colleagues in Turkey and maybe on the 12th of uh, August, we can do something together. Do you sure. agree to that? So I can speak about uh, surgery for parasurgical meningioma. They can speak about gamma knife for the parasurgical meningioma. Okay, we'll talk about it and get the details later. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.